Well, before we go into the short study for today, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Thanks. Dear Father in heaven, um, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together and um, receive light from your word to shine on our pathway so we know where to go and what to do. We just pray and ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to guide us this morning as we consider these themes and these uh, words of Christ and the stories of Christ. May you please help us to draw practical conclusions from what we understand and what we learn this morning so that we can apply it to our lives. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, um, this sermon, I guess, comes from, uh, or study, comes from a lot of thoughts that I was having before the coronavirus lockdowns came in. Um, and actually, it's the first sermon that I preached. So I preached at Nobby last week, uh, but it's the pretty much the same sermon. It's the first one that's come out of um, the lockdowns and everything. And so, you know, I mean, I don't know about everyone else here, but once the first lockdowns actually were put in place, um, pretty much like what we were saying before, there were a lot of thoughts running through my mind. Um, you know, like, is this be the beginning of the end? What, how does it all play in? And what do I do next? You know, um, if we think about the trials that are going to come on God's people, it's a big thing to try to meet, you know, in terms of human resources, like how are we going to be able to get through the things that we're going to have to face? And so there were many things on my mind at that time. And one of the first things I did was actually uh, defer my first semester of study just to clear up my mind and think about what to do next and uh, how to prepare for the end. And uh, I would, it would be an under, understatement to say that um, I was a bit stressed <laughs> and a bit anxious, you know, um, trying, to, trying to figure out, okay, what do I do next? What's the plan? And uh, it's not just God's people that are, that are facing the stress and the anxiety, you know, it's out in the world as well. Um, I was reading the, an, a report by the Australian National University, and it was reported that Australians were drinking a lot more frequently, and not water, <laughs> the bad stuff, um, a lot more frequently during lockdown conditions. Uh, yeah, that's right, stress. Uh, stress over, um, interestingly, the men were stressing out over the, you know, work-related things, but the women were stressing out over having to manage their children. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they had to drink more. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, you know, I mean, it just, this has really shown how broken people are. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. the fact that there's more of a domestic violence risk because mm -hmm. yeah. families are having to spend more time with each other, yeah. you know? And, uh, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, not only that, um, things like, well, just, I mean, stress in general, um, even as bad as just, you know, self-harm um, mm -hmm. and those sorts of things are twice as prevalent um, yeah. because of the, the pandemic. And so it's not just the pandemic of coronavirus, but there's so many other things that are playing in. But I think as God's people, we are very favored because we not only have the promises of God mm. for trials in general, but we have his prophecies that outline exactly mm. what is going to come to pass mm. and the things that are going to play into the end of time mm. and the issues that we need to face and that we have to meet. But God's promises that, that accompany those things. So we are we are very favored and we want to, this morning, we want to be able to establish ourselves mm. so that we can call other people onto the rock that is higher than we are. Mm -hmm. So we're told in Luke chapter 21, let's begin there. Luke 21, uh, I guess a familiar verse when, uh, whenever I find myself speaking about the last day events. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. And, and it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for those and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is a mental health crisis, and year after year, it's going to get worse and worse. We we know that. 
But we're not here to just dwell on these things today. We want to know what it is we can do, how we can establish ourselves to call people onto the rock, the rock that is higher than us. So let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Does God have confidence that he would like his people to have in these last days? 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And now, little children, oh, let me wait for us all to see the further. And it says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have what? Confidence. Confidence. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Does God want us to have confidence? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And he tells us what we should do. There's a little uh, five or six letter word. Sorry, I'm not in counting mode this morning. Five letter word that starts with A. Abide. God would have us abide in him so that when he comes, we are perfectly prepared to see him because we're with him every day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what does it mean to abide in these last days? Familiar verse. Let's go to Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> and it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and do what? Give, Give glory, glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship, worship him. That made heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Mm -hmm. Does the everlasting gospel, fearing God, giving glory to him, and worshipping him, sound like abiding in him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is the confidence of God's people today, mm -hmm. following the first angel's messages. And you will find that the second and third angel's messages flow on perfectly from that. Mm -hmm. Remain in God, stay away from the beast, come out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. So we are called, among other things, we want to focus this morning on what it means to worship God and how that will help us to call people to have the confidence that we can have in God. Mm -hmm. What does worshiping God have to do with that? How can through how is it that through worshiping God we can be living in the midst of a time when the, there is the distress of nations, when men's hearts are failing them, failing them from fear. How is it that we can find strength and certainty as we worship God? What does it mean to worship God? Well, we're going to turn to an un unlikely example in the Bible this morning and see just the powerful experience that God would like to give us. So we go to the story just as an introduction. Clothes all wet and cold, Christ and his disciples set foot on solid ground after what would have been their most difficult night. For the disciples, they felt as though they had looked into the very gaping jaws of death when the cold waves rolled over the little ship in the Sea of Galilee. Out there in the dark sea, the Christ spoke peace and brought them again to safety. Only now, they see death in another form, mm -hmm. running at them full speed on all fours across the shore <laughs> in the form of a demon-possessed man, looking like he's about to devour them, eat them alive. But Christ sees a soul to be one and an enemy to be conquered. So he who stood fearlessly before the tempest now stands fearlessly before this new threat. And the man who now hijacked by the enemy and more clearly represents the image of a wild beast than even a person is destined to become the first missionary of the master to his home city mm -hmm. and prepare a people for Christ's return. And we're going to see that today. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Mark chapter 5. Maybe we're all there or at another account of the same story. But we're going to study from Mark and uh, then switch over to Luke for the end. So Mark chapter 5, and we'll just go from verse 1. It says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. 
because that he had been often bound with chains and fed, uh, cha with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. What a sad experience. Does this sound like a mental health problem to you? Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> crying, harming himself, living amongst the dead. This is someone who has extreme issues. Now, what was the first step of deliverance in this man's experience? Worship. He ran. Right. He worship. He worship. Absolutely. Let's read verse 6 and 8. 6 to 8. It says, And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So let's underline with our minds this morning, he ran and worshipped him. Mm. The demoniac's first step in deliverance was coming to Christ. Mm. That's the first step in worship. Coming to Christ. Hold on to that thought. Coming to Christ. His words were not his own, but his heart was reaching out for help and deliverance, and Christ heard that heart cry. In its most basic form, that's what this man's worship was all about. So, let's have a brief study, dig deeper into the idea of worship. What does worship have to do with perfect <coughs> peace? Let's go to Psalm chapter 29 and verse 2. Psalm chapter 29 and verse 2. And the Bible says, Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. <coughs> Worship involves the, involves the beautiful unfolding of God's holiness in our lives. We worship him in the beauty of holiness. In essence, it is the restoration, or it involves the restoration of humanity from the slavery of sin into the holiness of God. This is the foundation of what perfect uh, what um, worship has to do with peace, because sin, slavery to sin, is like what we're seeing in the life of this demoniac. He is controlled by the enemy to do his will. So, what is practically involved in worship then? Let's look at a few Bible heroes. Exodus chapter thirty-five, verses five to nine. What does it actually mean to worship God practically? I, in studying this topic, I used to, due to the cartoons that I used to watch in my younger life, uh, there was this, always this picture of worship being these little characters dancing around an altar, you know? Something like what we would now know today as the priests of Baal worshipping, you know, crying out. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know? And I guess as you grow older, you sort of see that actually the, the Pentecostal movement really goes down that line a bit too much, you know? But not only the people in the church, which the world often mocks, but the people in the world themselves are involved in this pagan worship. You know, when they go to the rock concerts, what are they doing? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So what does true worship of God actually involve? Let's look at these great men of God and what they were able to gather up from their experience. It says in Exodus 34 and verse 5 down to 9. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and what? Gracious. Gracious, Gracious long-suffering and goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and unto the third and fourth generation. Now watch this. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth. And what did he do? Worship. He worshipped. Verse 9 explains it a bit more. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Moses worshipped God as he reverently bowed his head in holy appreciation of God's character. Mm -hmm. 
and when he reached out for God's presence and help. Now, can you see, Moses was having to deal with what kind of people? Stiff-necked. Stiff-necked people. That's not easy. No. Have any any one of us had to deal with someone who's just stubborn and does not care about what we have to say? That's what Moses was having to deal with, but not just one person. They estimate something like 1.2 or 1.5 million people like that. (laughs) Patience. Right. Moses found his strength as he worshipped God through an intelligent appreciation of his character and his role as a just judge and forgiver of sin and pleading for God's help. Okay, let's read another story. Uh, Read another example. Let's go to Job chapter 1, verse 20 to 22. What does it mean to worship God practically? Job chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. And the Bible says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down on the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return to them. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did what? Sin not. Sin not. The Lord charged God foolishly. Is this a man of strength and fortitude? Mm-hmm. Man, so much higher than anything that, you know, we can see for ourselves accomplishing. But by faith, we can, you know, we can enter in that, into that experience. Mm-hmm. By faith, you know, God, God is growing us and strengthening us in the little trials. But this man faced all the fury of the devil unleashed on him and his family. What gave him strength to stand firm? He worshipped. He fell down and he worshipped and he acknowledged God. You are still ruler over all. You have given, you have taken away. Blessed be your name. This is strength. Strength coming from faith as he ex- as he settled himself that God is still on the throne. And God, Job did not cease to seek the Lord. All through the book, you find him reaching out, asking for, asking, you know, <laughs> why? But that was the safest place for him to be. The safest place, because he was in the presence of God. And he did not let go. So there's more we can learn on this subject uh, of worship throughout the Bible, but it's summed up perfectly in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 and 4. So Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 and 4 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. It's God's will that he would be the one that carries us through. It's not ourselves. Not even, I mean, as we're speaking about worship, as we're speaking about faith, it's not even our ability to choose to have faith that carries us through. Yes, that is essential, but the power itself comes from God himself. And so this is the foundation upon which we're trying to build. We're trying to find the secret of strength. And it comes to worshipping. It's essentially all about keeping God ever before us, trusting in Him as our only helper through all the circumstances we face, and thus finding the secret of strength to press forward. Now, as we take our trials, as we take uh, our anxieties to God, sometimes they're practical things, and God uses material or practical ways to answer those needs. And it's easy to lose sight of the fact that it was God who orchestrated those things. You know, we think, oh, well, you know, they must have, must just be coincidence or what. <coughs> Not so. There are lessons in the Bible that help us to strengthen our faith, to see that God, when we cry to him, he is the one who orchestrates all the events that meet our needs. Consider Elijah. He was fed by the ravens, physical birds, that gave him food. He was housed by the widow. Was it not God who directed the steps of these people to meet? Was it not God who sent the ravens with food to Elijah? Mm -hmm. And we're going to be facing those trials in the the near future. Mm -hmm. Think about Paul during his missionary travels. He met Priscilla and Aquila, with whom he found employment by tent making, so he could work while preaching the gospel. Was it not God that orchestrated that? I mean, think about the myriad of people that he could have come into contact with. So God, as we worship God, as we 
uh, come to him acknowledging who he is and the responsibility that he takes on himself to to care for us. This is worship. And so worship offloads our burdens onto Christ where they should be. And as we think back to the demoniac, it frees us from unclean spirits. The unclean spirits of bitterness and unbelief and skepticism. That's what happens when we come to Christ. You know, his touch brings healing. Mm -hmm. A little quote here from Ministry of Healing I'd like to share. The love which Christ diffuses throughout the whole being is a vitalizing power. Every part, every vital part, the brain, the heart, the nerves, these are physical organs in our body. It touches with healing. By it, the highest energies of the being are aroused to activity. It frees the soul from guilt and sorrow. Anxiety and care, these are the unclean spirits. They crush the life forces. With it comes serenity and composure. It implants in the soul joy that nothing earthly can destroy. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Health-giving, life-giving joy. We're we're facing a time where the world, I mean, just every earthly support is going to be cut off, right? Like that's what we're going, that's what we're coming towards. And we can see it in the works. But in the midst of it all, God is calling us to experience a joy that nothing earthly can destroy. A joy that actually gives life and health and arouses every part to to activity. So we want to learn how it is that we can find perfect peace, but also not just when now's not the time to run to the hills. Now's the time to do stuff, right? So we don't want to just find perfect peace. We also want to be the servants of Christ in these last days. So let's continue on with the story in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 9 to 19. And it says, And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And they were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it into the city and in the country. And they went went out to see what it was that was done. And when they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Yes, let's stop there. So what we see just now is a tactical attempt by the enemy to close the doors of Christ's usefulness in that area. Are we facing a, a time where yeah. God is trying to clo- uh, the, de- the devil is trying to close the doors of usefulness for God's people? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. In this case, the devil is, tr- is trying to destroy property and then framing Christ as the one pro- uh, responsible mm-hmm. so that God gets the blame. Mm-hmm. It is the great controversy being played out in miniature. But Jesus sees two steps ahead. Initially, the people are afraid of the one who has destroyed so much property. One point to the devil. But this gives huge public publicity to the miraculous healing of the demoniac who everyone knew. So that when he is sent into the city to publish the good news, no one refuses to listen or to believe. And so we see seeming defeat is turned into a decided victory. More on that later. When, Jesus, when the people came, they see the man in a different state. What, was, what were the things that Mark used to describe him? He's clothed. Mm-hmm. He is right. sitting with Jesus in his right mind. Mm-hmm. Isn't that not the effects of worship which we saw earlier? Mm. Is not that the healing that we can experience when we come to God, giving Him our troubles? Absolutely. This is exactly what God designs that we should have as His servants. So in the initial phase, the man was worshipping, reaching out for deliverance. Now he is in a phase 
where he is to continue in order for him to stay free from the unclean spirits and to give him strength for the task that lies ahead. So how important is it that we find ourselves routinely sitting with Jesus and restoring a right mind if we desire to be his servants? Do you think it's important? Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's investigate a little. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Luke 10, 38, 42. So it says, Now it came to pass, this is one of my favorite little snippets in the Bible that speaks about the importance and the healing that we can have when we spend time with the Lord. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me alone? Bid her therefore that she will help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken from her. Martha, often troubled by how much she has to do, how little help she has, how alone she is. And Jesus calls her to choose that one thing that is needful in the midst of it all. There are many things that can be set aside and saved until later, but our time with the Lord can never be set aside and saved till later. <laughs> Morning worship is very important. It's very important. We see Martha struggling with a load of care. She's cumbered about, distracted. That's what the word means. Distracted from the Lord. So this is the necessary preparation for persevering effort in the work of God. Martha was not to stop serving, but she was to first receive strength. Quote from Desire of Ages, page 525. It says, The one thing that Martha needed was a calm, devotional spirit, a deeper anxiety for knowledge concerning the future mortal life, the graces necessary for spiritual advancement, you know, the fruit of the spirit. The cause of Christ needs careful, energetic workers. There's a wide field for Martha's with their zeal and active religious work, but let them first sit with Mary at the feet of Jesus. Let diligence, promptness, and energy be sanctified by the grace of Christ. Then the life will be an unconquerable power for good. Do we want to be an unconquerable power for good? Yeah. Something that not even the coronavirus can stop us, <laughs> you know? Uh, we all have cares of life. We all have to, you know, pay the bills and do this and that. But when we come to Christ, when we spend time meditating on his word, we find that strength that is necessary to get us through, help us to go that little extra to tell someone about the Lord. So I would recommend study the counsels we have on how to have devotions. Ministry of Healing speaks about spending time in nature. If you read in the book Education, there's uh, music plays a big uh, part in, in you know, how we worship God. David, when he was out with the sheep, what was he doing? Singing. Playing and singing. <laughs> and God said, this is a man after my own heart. See what blessings are in store for us. Now for the former demoniac, little did he know that this time would be his only personal class with Jesus before being sent out to evangelize, not only his friends, but his entire city. So we see his experience in the power of God and this time spent with Christ was essential to giving a correct witness and vindicating the character of Christ after the destruction of the swine, which was really the devil's fault. And so what a lesson for us as we are in the midst of this great controversy where people blame God whenever something goes wrong in the world. They do not blame the devil. Why? <laughs> He's the devil. They blame God. And so God has placed us here. He has told us to remain so that we can rectify things. We can set the record straight. And, you know, 2020 is showing us that things are really coming to a point where it's just one thing after the other. You know, on the heels of coronavirus, what's next? In the midst of coronavirus, what else is going to come? And we've been saying that for years. Things are going to get more frequent and more intense. So how much closer we need to be with God now more than ever? Now is the time to restore our time with him. Personal devotion. 
And even as I speak, I'm convicted on that point. Yeah. So we turn now to our final point. Let's pick up the story again in Mark chapter 5, verse 16 to 20. Mark 5, 16 to 20. Uh, well, we kind of already read 16, so um, go from 18 down to 20. It says, And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends. Tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. So in a few scenes earlier, the whole town comes out to see Christ. And they're saying, go, we don't, we don't want you here. We don't understand what you're doing here. We, we are afraid. Get out of this, this area. And so just imagine Jesus humbles himself and submits to the wishes of the people. Okay, okay, I'll go. Come, let's go. Disciples, let's go. He submits to the wishes of the people and gets back into the boat. But the man who was filled with the demons is filled already with a sense of longing, with a sense of being left behind. He runs over to the little ship and falls before the master, asking, Lord, I can come with your disciples. I can, I can preach. I can come. Please let me come. I've got nowhere else to go. Anyway, come on. But Jesus says no. The rich young ruler was asked, to come and follow. Mm. Matthew, the tax, co tax collector, and the other disciples, they were asked, come, follow me. But to this one, Jesus says, go home to your friends. Tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and have had compassion on you. Do you think that, I mean, the man was crying out, Lord, let me be with you. Mm. Do you think that in Christ telling him to go and to, or to stay, that Christ would be any further from him than the other disciples? Well, through the power of his Holy Spirit, he would be closer to him, actually, living in his heart. We know the promise in Matthew chapter 28. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the, to the, end of the world. Isn't that what he says? Yeah. Christ is with us always. The man accepts the position and the work appointed him by Jesus, devotes all he is and all he has to the proclamation of the gospel in his area. And guess what? Not one complaint is recorded by the man. You won't find it there. You see, humble acceptance of our position in life and the great work that God has given us to do brings stability and fortitude. Let me read this quote from Ministry of Healing, page 473. Our plans are not always God's plans. He may see that it is best for us and for his cause to refuse our very best intentions, as he did in the case of David. But of one thing we may be assured, he will bless and use in the advancement of his cause those who sincerely devote themselves and all they have to his glory. If he sees best not to grant their desires, he will counterbalance their refusal by giving, please listen, by giving them tokens of his love and entrusting to them another service. Mm -hmm. Isn't that not what he did for the man, the demon man? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The man wanted to go preach, mm -hmm. but Jesus says, there's people waiting for you. A little down that road. Yes, we may feel that our influence is small, where we are. That there is a greater, wider work that we can do. Or there are more exciting adventures to be had. But we're here. Why? Because God needs someone right now. He does. We are needed just here. If not us, then who? Who? And when Christ returned, like when Christ refused uh, the man to come with him, yes, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he would be with him. Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Family, we know in a heartbeat now, it's no longer by faith, it's now by sight. We know in a heartbeat that things can be shut down just like that. Mm -hmm. Common liberties restricted. May the lesson of COVID-19 never fade from our hearts. Mm -hmm. We know that the opportunity to work can be taken away just like that. Now more than ever, we need to be putting forward some 
persevering effort in some line of religious work, though it may be small, though it may be small, it is needed. It is absolutely needed. I'd like to share a little experience of encourage, just to encourage us this morning, um, because I guess not all of us can be preaching evangelistic series or, um, you know, doing the work in the wider field. But my mum is a assistant nurse in an aged care facility down in Brisbane. And uh, she didn't even finish high school, um, but she was able to go and get the certificate three um, with my brother, actually, and my sister. At her work, people, you know, this is her first full-time job, actually, in life. I mean, she's always had work here and there, but mainly she's been at home with the children and helping her parents before she was married and that type of thing. Um, but she enjoys it. And people ask, why? You know, they just ask, like, how can you always be happy, you know? I mean, as Christians, we often get asked that question, and sometimes she laughs it off. Um, but other times, when the time is right, she says, you know, I, I pray, I pray, or I have faith in God. And so as she wins their confidence, sometimes they invite her over to her house. And these are in, often international students, so they come over with their partner from India or from uh, Nepal, and they come with nothing, pretty much nothing, so they're struggling. And um, they invite her around for a meal, and, you know, they, they eat together and they share their story, things that they're struggling with. And mum offers to these Hindu people, can I pray with you? And they say, oh, sure. What do we need to do? <laughs> you know, they're expecting to set up a little idol or something yeah. like that, you know, have a little ceremony. And mum just says, oh, that's okay. We just talk to God. Oh, okay. So they pray at the table, just sitting there. And mum has told me that um, a couple of times with one or two of the people, um, when they open their eyes, both the husband and the wife are in tears, crying, you know, because they're struggling, but they believe that this woman's prayer who cares so much about us, I think God will hear it, you know? <laughs> Whatever little faith they have. And God is able to use that. He really is. That's a seed firmly planted. So maybe we can't preach with people, but we can pray with people. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can't um, do a, a myriad of other things, but we can share a little track. I was speaking to a friend who works in a health retreat and she does, she used to canvas and now she's working in this health retreat and she prays for opportunities to share the gospel. And um, just last week, she was so excited because she was able to share a promise with someone. You know, someone come and they're stressed out from the world, not a Christian. Mm -hmm. And they come in and they share their work trials and she says, oh, well, you know, the Bible says if anyone asks wisdom, God will not upbraid them. That's the old language, but the word upbraid means, and she explains it to them, you know, <laughs> explain the King James language to these people. And um, yeah, and you know, it leaves a firm impression. We can just share what little faith and strength that we receive from our worship experience with God to other people. Time is short. Let's do something. Let's do something. Let's combine our efforts with prayer, and we will be surprised at who will open up. God will guide. God will broaden our influence. He will. Look at the man. Jesus said, go home to your friends. But he reached the city. <laughs> God calls us to show forth his power by our testimonies as well. Ministry of Healing, page 99, says the gospel is to be presented not as a lifeless theory, but as a living force to change the life. God would have his servants bear testimony to the fact that through his grace, men may possess Christ-likeness of character and may rejoice in the assurance of his great love. To the, to the fact that he cannot be satisfied until all who accept his salvation are re reclaimed and reinstated in their holy privileges as his sons and daughters. Our life, you know, the purity and the uprightness of our lives is a witness. It's a huge witness. In these times when there is so much moral uncertainty and instability, firm stand for what is right and what is true is a powerful witness. People will open up and ask about that. So God is glorified by a testimony, but we can ask people in simple directness, especially in these times. Did you know that all these things that we are facing have been foretold in the Bible, in biblical prophecy? That's the question that I ask people when I work. <laughs> Not Christian people. People in, you know, in the world, they don't know what is, you know, book of Hezekiah. I mean, book of Hezekiah. They don't know what is book of Nahum, etc., you know? You can just ask them, did you know that these things are foretold in biblical prophecy? You can explain that to them. It works. <laughs> Simple directness is needed in these times. 
All right, I'd like to close with one last passage. What is the sure result of this work? if we have the Holy Spirit and prayer to empower our witness. And this is the result that we are all aiming for. Let's go to Luke chapter 8, verse 38 to 40. Luke 8, 38 to 40. Okay, so this is the same story told through the eyes of Luke. It says... Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, that's the second coming. That is the second coming right there. When Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him. Why? They were all waiting for him. This is our God. Lo, we have waited for him. We see the results of a man who was told to go home (laughs) and preach the gospel. And not only he was ready, but his city was ready to receive Christ. Well, this is the this is the result. This is the harvest that we're all waiting for. I personally want to be found active in his service. I don't want to be sitting around saying, Lord, what can I do? I mean, you know, giving a glow track to someone that, who knows how many people are going to read it? Who cares? Someone will. Life's pressures are hard and busy, like we said before, but through prayer and faith, God will give strength. He will. He absolutely will. Take courage. As we follow the lesson of this man delivered from demon possession, Christ will use us. This story is placed here to show us that when we work where we are, when we do what little we can with what little we know, we will be increased. We will grow. God will broaden our influence. He will strengthen us. And he will use our efforts to prepare people, not only for us to be saved, but for others to be saved. So is it your desire, along with me, to come into closer friendship with Christ? So not be found going one morning without spending time with the Lord and then seeking to do the work, the day's work. It's my desire to surrender everything to the Lord, like Moses and Job, find our strength in worship. Is it your desire? It is. It is for me, especially in these times. Especially in these times. So let's go forwards with strength, courage, confidence, and stability, knowing that Christ wants us to be confident in these times. Trusting in you. Thank you. Amen. Mm-hmm. <coughs>